seven. Um, our, our, our remark is also um, the publication of, um, together with uh, um, Robin McKay on Nick Lang, Fan Phenomena, Selective Writings, 1987-2007, uh, published by Urbanomic Sequence 2011. And amongst the many papers that he has recently write, I want to uh, he has written, recently written, uh, I want to highlight uh, the, um, the article Nominalism, Naturalism and Materialism, Sellers' Critical Ontology in Contemporary Philosophical Naturalism and Its Implication, uh, published by Rutledge in 2013. Uh, Ray's current research develops a naturalistic account of rationality, addressing the Enlightenment notion of reason, and more contemporary accounts of inferentialism and functionalism. Um, today he's going to talk about rules, games, and patterns, and um, he's going, his talk is going to be followed by a response by um, Inigo Wilkins, who is a researcher, a PhD researcher at the Center for Cultural Studies, who is working on the scientific and manifest image of noise in economics and music. So without further ado, thank you, Ray. So thanks, uh, Luciana, for inviting me. Um, so um, first thing um, I should say, this talk is, uh, um, it's not the, uh, it has a different title and the topic is different from the one that was uh, initially advertised. Um, it's not going to focus so much on the work of uh, Robert Brandon, um, as I hope to, but more on the on the work of Wilfred Sellers, uh, on whom I'm writing a book. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, I hope that you know the uh, some of the things I say or that I'll be discussing will be relevant to the uh, the central topics of the workshop. Um, although. I mean, I should say from the outset, I'm not, I'm by no means, you know, an expert on uh, computationalism and robotics or artificial intelligence, and I think uh, Giuseppe Longo and Joanna Seid both know about those two things far more than I do. So this is more like a kind of a warm-up for their interventions, and I think that some of the things um, that I say now will probably be fleshed <coughs> out in more detail by Johanna Seid in her talk. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to begin by uh, focusing on the uh, two aspects of the mind. Um, the Brentano thesis famously says that intentionality is the mark of the mental. Um, so in order to understand the mind, we have to um, characterize uh, minds as intentional systems. Uh, and then the puzzle consists in figuring out what exactly how to understand intentionality. Um, Kant is credited with a fundamental distinction between sapience and, sem and sentience. And the inferentialist project, as developed by, first by Sellers and then by Robert Brandom, is predicated on this fundamental Kantian distinction. These are the two aspects of the mind which map on to, you know, th this distinction can be cashed out in, very, in lots of different ways. It's, it's been currently cashed out by people like dualists such as uh, David Chalmers in terms of the distinction between the phenomenal or experiential aspects of mind, which would be sentience, and the psychological or functional aspects of mind, which would be sapience. So sapience is reasoning or ratiocination, whereas sentience is awareness or consciousness. Um, and here then, there's two different kinds of intentionality, okay? Because the intentionality of conceptual thought, um, the old, what Sellers called the oddness of thought, is fundamentally different from the intentionality in sensation, in awareness. In other words, to think about something isn't the same as to be aware of something. Okay. So then we have. So then the problem is articulating these three terms: sapience, sentience, and intentionality. And the question is, is the intentionality of mind rooted in sapience or in sentience? Which of these aspects will be more fundamental? Um, now, phenomenology roots intentionality in sentience and argues that sapience is conditioned by sentience. In other words, uh, consciousness, you know, conscious experience, is what allows us to have thoughts about things. Okay? 
Um, it follows that if sentience is primary, the condition for creating artificial minds would be the creation of artificial life. Um, you'd have to create consciousness, sensory consciousness in the full-blooded sense, in order to be able to generate the kind of complex, you know, discursive conceptual intentionality which characterizes human beings. Um, but if sentience comes first, artificial life becomes a, a contradiction in terms. Of sense. Sentience cannot be algorithmically decomposed according to, hence, the hostility in, amongst lots of uh, uh, phenomenologists or people inspired by the phenomenological, phenomenological tradition to the computational paradigm in philosophy of mind. Uh, and this, I guess, is exemplified by inactivism, the radical externalism, radi anti representationalist account of the mind. Um, so, the contrary position, and the, the position being articulated, I think, developed in the most interesting way um, by Sellers, is the position which roots intentionality in sapience and argues that sentience is conditioned by sapience. In other words, that even our, uh, our, our sensory experience, our sensations of things, are conditioned by our conceptual capacities. Um, which are uh, characterized in terms of rule-governed discursive practice. So this is the basic tenet of inferentialism, that uh, conceptual rationality consists of rule-governed transitions between assertions, um, and that there is such that even our perceptual transactions with the world are rule-governed, are inferentially articulated. Um, now, what is a rule? Okay, a rule is not simply a causal regu regularity or a dispositional mechanism. It's a normative injunction of the form do A and C, do A asterisk and C asterisk, etc. So rules are normative functions, not causal functions. Um, and this is a crucial difference in understanding um, normative function functionalism from, you know, classical causal functionalism. Uh, the, uh, the ability to follow a rule or to do something in, uh, because of a rule cannot simply be understood as the actualization of a disposition. Um, deviation from a rule is error, whereas causal deviation is malfunction. Reasoners err, but nature doesn't make mistakes. Okay. Um, the, an unactualized disposition in a physical system um, is, can always be explained in terms of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the non-actuality of the, the relevance or the appropriate causal mechanisms that would have um, set it, you know, actualized it. Now, causal function is straightforwardly mechanizable. So, therefore, it's computationally tractable, and that was always why, you know, if function was it is, the, uh, the kind of the orthodox kind of ideology for, I guess, classical um, computationalism. Um, it's computationally tractable, although its adequacy as a paradigm for understanding minds has been much contested, principally by waves of anti-representationalist um, ideologues. <coughs> Another way of saying this is that causal functioning is predictable. Where prediction fails, causal dysfunction is explicable by invoking the intervention of some other causes. In other words, if some system fails to do what you expected it to do, you can straightforwardly explain, you will look for some intervening cause that <coughs> prevented it from doing this thing. Um, so then the question is, is, is normative function computationally intractable? Is it inherently unpredictable? It's tempting to construe normative functioning's irreducibility to causal functioning as evidence of what Kant called spontaneity. Called the spontaneity of the understanding, which is, of course, another way of talking about freedom. <coughs> but if we want to avoid a metaphysical reification of freedom, as some sort of supernatural force, we have to find a way of integrating normative functioning within causal functioning. It's not simply enough to say that uh, normative functioning is irreducible to causal functioning. Only this way may we avoid lapsing into a dualism of rules and causes or 
of the normative and the physical. And I think it's precisely um, you know, my, uh, my interest in Selger's work is, is, is motivated by the conviction that he um, understood the risks of generating this dualism, which is just a kind of... Uh, um, it's not the classical Cartesian dualism, it's not kind of a classic you know, mind-body dualism or mental-physical dualism. Um, but insofar as a dualism is, as Brandon says, an unarticulated distinction, unless one can explain how rules interact with causes or how rules are embedded in causes, one will inevitably relapse into kind of some kind of dualism. So, whether and how normative functioning may be integrated into causal functioning depends on how we understand rule following. Now, this is where the difficulties begin. Um, is it possible to follow a rule without being conscious of the rule, without understanding or intending the rule? Um, either this consciousness of, if, we're, if we have to be conscious of a rule, or if we have to be thinking of a rule in order to be able to follow it, um, then we need a rule to be able to follow the rule. Okay. Um, so the, you know, because the consciousness of the rule will be determined by another rule, which itself presupposes consciousness of it, and we're off on an infinite regress. Um, the alternative is to insist that consciousness of the rule consists in some sort of immediate grasp of awareness of the rule as a rule. But then this comes at the cost of rooting intentionality in, in sentience after all, because there's a kind of immediate uh, conceptual, a, there's a grasp of something as something, a conceptual comprehension, um, which is not itself um, articulated by a more fundamental, by a rule, which is not itself rule governing. Um, so the challenge for the inferentialist is to give an account of rule following which does not presuppose some form of original awareness or consciousness of rules. And to do so, we must distinguish between understanding and awareness. Someone can understand how to follow a rule without being aware of what the rule is. This allows us to account for the difference between someone doing something in conformity with a rule, without grasping the, that rule, um, and someone obeying a rule that they have properly grasped. And this is really the distinction between doing something, you know, Dana, I think, explains this very well in terms of the distinction between doing something for a reason, um, which most animals do, uh, evolution um, you know, uh, generates uh, motivations um, for animal behavior, sometimes extremely sophisticated and complicated uh, motivations, reasons for doing something, but those animals are completely oblivious, need not be aware, need not know anything about these uh, reasons, okay, these uh, motivating factors. Um, so this distinction then between awareness and understanding helps us avoid the circularity whereby consciousness always explained by grasping a rule, while grasping a rule is explained in terms of consciousness of. At the same time, it allows us to explain what it is to grasp a rule without resorting to any um, unexplicated notion of awareness. Um, okay, so now Sellers tries to kind of will will you know uh, try to get to grips with this topic in his discussion of language games. Um, and the first thing to understand is that the, the, a, a game is simply, um, you know, a game is at once a set of rules and a complex pattern of behaviour incarnating those rules. Individual moves in the game contribute to the realisation of this complex pattern. The structure of the pattern is determined by the ways in which the rules are realised through the succession of moves that constitutes this particular game. Each move in the game realizes parts of the pattern according to a rule. But while the pattern is a physical phenomenon, it's tempting to maintain that the rules through which the pattern is realized are not. 
This is a temptation that must be resisted if we want to avoid this dualism of, uh, of rules and causes. So the, the task is to de-reify rules. The temptation to, to reify them can assume a platonic or an Aristotelian form. The platonic variant consists in reifying the rules as ideal structures subsisting independently of the patterns that, in, that incarnate them. The Aristotelian variant consists in reifying them as ideal functions shaping inert physical substrates. To de-reify rules is to see how normative function is embedded in causal function and how logical powers are realized by causal powers. And this last um, uh, specification is crucial. Um, and I think this is really, or well, this is, I think, is what I find particularly fascinating or compelling about Sellers' approach. Uh, he insists that um, uh, logical power, which is to say inferential valence, um, is um, embedded in causal efficacy. So in other words, we have to understand the relationship between inference and causation. Um, um, this is expressed, you know, this is, uh, this conviction is expressed in Sellers' famous claim that espousals of principle, which is to say rules, are reflected in uniformities of performance. Okay. But what's, what's, what has to be emphasized here is that it's the espousals that are reflected in behavior, not the principles themselves. A principle is espoused through the attitude we adopt towards it. And this attitude cannot be that of intending the rule, since the rule is supposed to be the source of intention. Thus, rule-governed activity cannot be separated from conditioned behavior. So, now, okay, here's a, a quote, first quote from, uh, from Sellers, um, about the notion of the, the, the relationship between, um, you know, rule-governed activity and pattern-governed behavior. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a... I apologize for the length of the quote, but it's, it's actually really, I think, quite helpful. Um, so this is from Some Reflections on Language Games from 1954. To learn pattern-governed behavior is to become conditioned to arrange perceptible elements into patterns and to form these in turn into more complex patterns and sequences of patterns. Presumably such learning is capable of explanation in stimulus res re response reinforcement terms, the organism coming to respond to patterns as wholes through being, among other things, awarded when it completes gappy instances of these patterns. Pattern-governed behavior of the kind we should call linguistic involves positions and moves of the sort that would be specified by formation and transformation rules in its metagame if it were rule-obeying behavior. Okay, and, and the key thing is we're going to try to understand this distinction between pattern-governed and rule-obeying behavior. And, and the, this is, I've highlighted the crucial, uh, the, the, the crucial claim. Thus, learning to infer, i.e. reasoning, learning to reason, learning, acquiring conceptual competence, where this is purely a pattern-governed phenomenon, would be a matter of learning to respond to a pattern of one kind by forming another pattern related to it in one of the characteristic ways specified at the level of the rule obeying use of language by a transformation rule. That is, a formally stated rule of inference. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is um, try to give a kind of, well, uh, maybe absurdly kind of condensed summary of the, uh, the, what I take to be the crucial claim in the uh, Some Reflections on Language Games, which is the, uh, the intrication of game and metagame. Okay? Um, which is also the intrication of pattern-governed and rule-obeying behavior. Um, now, Sellers makes a distinction between, um, he says there's something interesting, you can define a game, a game is defined by its rules, but the rules themselves are not part of the game. 
It, you have to know the rules or obey the rules when you're playing the game, but um, you don't state or declare the rules when you're playing the game. Okay? So in other words, there's a, a, dis a distinction of levels, and he, he likens this Seller's models it, or it's not the same, but he, he kind of models it on the distinction between object language and meta language, even though it's not a linguistic distinction. Um, just as in an object language, an object language consists of first order, you know, discourse about things, about the world. A meta language is the uh, is the kind of the, the stratum which contains the uh, the, the rules governing. Uh, the proper use or the proper functioning of sentences in the object language. So, Sellers' paradigm is the chess. He's going to use the chess analogy. Um, it's very popular in the 1950s amongst Anglophone philosophers. Um, so here you've, you've got these two levels. Okay, The lower level is the game level. Think about that as analogous to the object language level. And the upper level is the meta game. Okay? Every game includes its own meta game. Okay? The meta game is the level at which the rules governing, the rules that define the game, find expression. Um, so, um, what Sellers will do is say that um, this transition um, between levels is what happens when you, um, when you actually learn to obey a rule. Okay. So uh, the lower level, um, simply, to, you know, here you have, let's say, I couldn't find uh, any symbols corresponding to chess pieces. So just assume that these things correspond to a, um, a bishop and a king. Okay. So, a bishop-shaped piece of wood next to a king-shaped piece of wood. Now, it's important that you can't um, use if any expression such as bishop or king is, in a way, is going to be a metagame expression because you need to know the rules to, to understand <coughs> what it is for something to be a bishop or a king in this, in this game. Sellers distinguishes between perception, reasoning, and action. Okay? So he says that the first, the initial, um, just as in everyday discourse, okay, we perceive a state of affairs. Okay? We perceive um, a water bottle sitting on a table. Um, and then this perception may, um, we see that the, the bottle of water is on the table. And then we say the bottle of water is on the table. This is a language entry transition. This is when you enter from a non-linguistic state into a linguistic state. Okay. There's a, a similar transition from the game to the metagame. There's a language entry transition from perceiving a configuration of bishop and king-shaped pieces of wood on a board to thinking that my king is, is checked by his bishop. Okay. Um, so there's a transition from the game into the meta game. There's an ascension into a higher level um, where you think you, you have a an, you have a, a conceptualized thought, which is about these pieces of wood that you are currently perceiving. So this is the first step: the moving from the game to a meta game. Okay. Um, the next step is inference. Okay, moving within the, me the meta game. This is an interlanguage game. Any, any instances of reasoning, so any claims such as um, you know, red is a color, uh, crimson is a shade of red, these are intra language moves because you don't need any information about the world. You don't rely on perceptual information to be able to execute these inferences. Okay. Um, so, from the, the basic, the rule of the game, if a bishop checks my king, interpose a pawn, I make the move to, then I must interpose a pawn. Nothing has yet happened. I haven't moved any pieces of wood yet. Okay? Um, 
The final stage, the third and final stage, is the language exit transition, which corresponds to action, where you have, you're motivated by the injunction interposed upon, okay, which makes you do something. You move a pawn-shaped piece between a bishop-shaped piece and a king-shaped piece. Okay. Now these, okay, this is a very, this is a cartoon version of kind of Sellers' origins, okay? But, um, the claim is that, the key claim is that all that is required in order to carry out, in order to, to reason, in order to do something for a reason, or to do something because of a rule, as opposed to merely in conformity with a rule, is a kind of practical know-how, and not um, theoretical knowledge, not knowing that. So, I think this, it took me a long time to understand this. Okay. But the way in which you avoid the infinite regress, or whereby, you know, if you need, um, if all concepts are rules, how can you understand what a concept is without having a rule to follow the rule? Okay. If you needed, either you have, either your ability to recognize a concept presupposes that you already have another concept, okay? And then you have this infinite regress. You need to have a concept of a concept of a concept or a rule for a rule for a rule. Or you terminate the regress by saying, no, you just have this kind of intuitive, you know, preconceptual awareness, which allows you to simply to understand something as something. Okay? But then we're back into what Sellers calls the myth of the given. The, the, the idea that things you can have direct preconceptual acquaintance with something as something. That's one version of the myth of the given. Um, you, Sellers turn, kind of solves the problem by saying the transition um, from uh, language to meta-language or from uh, game to meta-game is itself a kind of know-how and not knowing that. Okay? You need to know how to ascend from one level to another, and the even at the at the meta level, at the meta game level, all that is ensuring, or rather, kind of uh, uh, precipitating the transition, is practical know-how. Okay, there is no so that reasoning inference is just a kind of practical competence, and not necessarily a kind of. Uh, um, <coughs> theoretical or kind of you know, theoretical uh, reflection or deliberation. So perceiving a specific configuration of bishop and king shaped pieces of wood as a bishop so perceiving sorry, um, a bishop and king shaped pieces of wood as a bishop checking a king inferring that if one king is threatened by a bishop interpose a pawn and interposing <coughs> one's pawn are all rule-governed practical competences. Um, so reasoning is a kind of, essentially a kind of practice, um, which supervenes on certain um, habituations or some kind of uh, basic behavioral condition. You have to be trained to reason, but that training endows you with the capacity to effectuate what seem to be spontaneous um, transitions okay? as opposed to kind of mechanically insured um, causal transitions um, here's okay I thought another quote uh, this this I think will be the, the last <laughs> one um, from the same paper words which mention the positions of a game which is to say position words, are we might say the observation words of a rule language. And in addition to their syntactical role in the rule language, they occur in sentences which come to be occupied as a result of a language entry transition into the rule language, in which transition the stimulus is a situation of the kind meant by the position words. Action in joining context, on the other hand, are the motivating expressions of the rule language, and in addition to their syntactical role in this rule language, they occur in sentences, the occupying of which is the stimulus for a language departure 
transition, out of the rule language to a response which is an action of the kind mentioned in the motivating context. This is basically Sellers' gloss on the, the, the schema I just uh, tried to show. So, um, the meta game then states the rules governing the game. Thus, competence in the game requires competence in the meta game. The ability to see bishop, pawn, and king shaped objects as pieces in the game is a rule presupposing familiarity with the other rules governing relations between pieces. So, in this sense, I think it's possible to say that the meta game states explicitly the rules that are <coughs> implicit in every movement and position of pieces in the game. You know, uh, hence, this is why when you're playing a game, you don't need to state or to conceptually articulate the rules in accordance with which you are playing the game. Um, moves made because of the rules, okay, and this simply means to make a, a move because of a rule, which is to say that's the only way in which, the only sense in which, in which you can be sensed to be playing the game, this is bit, or acting for a reason, are unpredictable because they cannot be tracked by facts at the level of the object game, or at least this is a, a conjecture. Um, one way of understanding the unpredictability of sapient beings, of, uh, of reasoners such as ourselves, um, is because... Um, there are two, there's a, you know, there's a stratification of levels, and information about the object level will not suffice to help you understand what is you know, going on um, at, the, uh, at the meta game level. Now, but this is not to say, or at least it would be very hasty to conclude from this, therefore, that reasoning, or what we call or, you know, the spontaneity of the understanding, is somehow radically indeterminable or uncomputable. Okay? So I think we'd have to be hesitant about simply saying that this is, a, in other words, this is a way of understanding freedom um, without any kind of, you know, you know, without any kind of metaphysical libertarian, without postulating some kind of numeral will. Um, okay. Um, now, but language must enable language users to find their way around in the world and satisfy their needs. So if inferential moves make a difference in the world, if reasoning makes a difference in the world, language must be articulated with the world, otherwise than by representing it. Because we can, you know, uh, this, you know, inferentialism, um, you know, Sellers and Brandom insist that language does not represent, or meaning rather, meaning, doesn't stand for anything in the world. It doesn't designate um, features or properties of the world. So then the question is, how do the rules governing perception, reasoning, and action gain traction on the world? Okay, and here now I'm going to have a, a quick kind of going to discussion of a, another a paper by Sellers called uh, um, Knowing and Being Known. Uh, in which there is a, a fascinating discussion of um, whether or not uh, <coughs> reasoning, um, rationality, as, as, as we characterize it, could be mechanically instantiated. Um, but what I want to do, the, the point about this um, is to understand the connection between, on the one hand, what we just the discussion of the relationship between games and metagames, which is the relationship between pattern-governed and rule-obeying behavior, okay. and um, the, uh, let, let's say, the kind of the modeling, the kind of modeling of the world that uh, organisms and other kind of, uh, you know, let's say kind of, sentient um, systems need to be able to engage in in order to be able to kind of find their way around and do what it is they want to do. Okay. So Sellers, this is a you know, paper written in the early 60s, so it probably its frameworks may seem anachronistic, but I think the basic point is still very powerful. 
Um, the robot has a wiring, diag wiring diagram which determines transformations from senses to other senses in accordance with mathematical and logical principles. Okay? Um, so these would simply be kind of uh, you know, logical um, well, logical inferences, um, transformation principles. Um, if it's trying to find its way about in the world, in our world, we assume that it would have to have something analogous to a principle of induction. So it would, it, it would contain the equivalent of inductive generalizations such that if its tape uh, contains sentence pairs such as lightning at P, lightning at place, um, place one, lightning at time T1, thunder at place um, plus delta P, T plus delta T. And no sentence pairs like lightning at P, T, quiet at P plus delta P, T plus delta T. Okay. If that's a, then it would print such sentences such as whenever lightning at P, T, thunder at P plus delta P, T plus delta T. So this is, um, through this series of inscriptions, okay, through what, what, what is unfolding through the wiring diagram and the instructions that generate these ins this series of inscriptions in the robot's wiring diagram is a representation of, a representation or a model, if you will, of the robot's world, its environment. Okay. Um, so... In a way, like all organisms need some kind of representational system in order to be able to map the world around them. And this is the function of representation. Um, so then the crucial distinction then becomes between signification, which is semantic and norm-governed and, and properly conceptual, um, and um, representation. Okay. Representation or mapping. Okay. So in other words, it's one thing to know things about the world and to be able to think about the world, and it's another thing to be able to find your way about the world on the basis of what you think. But you need two different accounts to articulate these levels. In the order of signification, in the, in, the, in the conceptual dimension, or the order of signification, let's say the inscription, this inscription on the tape pattern, the four, uh, the four dots, can be said to signify lightning. Uh, and the pattern, you know, the pattern, you, we see in square dots 915, can be said to signify lightning at place 9 at time 15. Um, what is it to say that something signifies? Or what is, you know, signification here just means meaning. If you say that this linguistic expression means this, according to Sellers, what, what you're doing is you're establishing a functional equivalence between a quoted expression in a foreign language or so, some kind of uh, um, unfamiliar linguistic expression and a familiar expression of your own language. In other words, you're pointing to this sign or inscription in this unfamiliar um, you know, tongue and saying it plays the same role in this uh, symbolic system as this expression here with which we assume uh, our interlocutor is already familiar. Okay. So in order to say what something signifies, you have to show what an expression in your home language does. Okay. So for instance, if you say that... Um, you know, if you say that... Um, uh, éclair in French means lightning in French. Okay, someone you can, you know, the point of that, that's uh, an informative claim insofar as someone who do do doesn't understand French, you're taking this sound or this inscription in French, which your, your auditor doesn't understand, and you're saying it does, it plays exactly the same role in French as lightning does, okay, when I say it and mean it in English. Okay. So this is what it means to establish a functional equivalence between the robotese sign design and the English sign design lightning. 
as well as one between the, this other robot he's sign design and the English expression lightning at place 9 in time 15. So, this um, maps, in a way, picture, but this a map is an orientation system which allows uh, a, kind of a, a system to um, orient itself in the world by picturing, picturing um, certain features or aspects of the world. Okay, again, this is... A, one uh, concept, one of Serge's concepts, I think, which has been much misunderstood and uh, I think unfairly kind of dismissed. Um, but I think it's particularly, um, you know, particularly helpful if one wants to kind of show. In fact, it's it's indispensable if one one, under, one wants to understand how rules are embedded in the causal order. So picturing does not consist in a relation of resemblance between representation and represented. It consists in the structural equivalence between properties of relations among representations considered as natural objects and properties among represented objects. So, there's a systematic correlation between tokenings of the robotese, lightning, éclair and lightning, in Robotese, French and English, and instance, instances of lightning in the world. Um, the, the point, again, this is, uh, I think, a crucial nuance. The point is that Sellers describes picturing as a second-order isomorphism. Okay, it's not an isomorphism between two objects. It's an isomorphism between two systems of objects, okay? between relations... So a system of objects consists of is a system of relations. Okay. To call picturing a second order isomorphism is to say that it's a relation of relations. Okay. Um, so there are matter of factual, and these relations can be understood as matter of factual properties relating particular occurrences of these inscriptions and vocalizations to particular occurrences <coughs> of lightning. This system of relations constitutes a pattern in the causal order, and it is this pattern which incarnates the rule. Okay, and now um, I think, what, and actually, what I want to kind of uh, conclude with is, um, I think, a possible contrast between patterns and processes. Um, I think uh, Johanna will have much more to say about this. Um, this afternoon, but um, I think I'm, incre I'm increasingly convinced that there is a really significant distinction between patterns and processes in uh, Sellers' work. A pattern is a complex mosaic of matter of factual relations. But if Sellers insists the world consists of things and not facts, then patterns are not Processes, at least insofar as Sellers is, <coughs> seems to be, you know, committed to a process ontology, um, an ontology of at what he calls absolute processes. Um, I'm assuming here that absolute processes don't have propositional form. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. I might be wrong about this. Uh, but patterns, insofar as they're composed of object-bound relations. Um, seem to have, that, you know, they're um, statable. Okay, you can uh, you can describe a pattern in terms of a series of facts. Um, you know, the facts which instantiate this pattern, um, and these facts are object bound in that they consist of relations amongst objects, amongst well individuated objects in space and time. Um, and it seems that, or at least you know, um, it's not obvious that processes can be, well, he, he, Sellers explicitly says that processes are not object-bound. Okay. Absolute processes cannot be um, attached um, or um, delimited in terms of objects or relations of objects. Um, okay. Um, well, that's 
I think I sh I'll stop. That's, um, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So uh, first, thank you to uh, all the speakers for accepting to come and uh, speak today, and uh, thank you, Ray, for this uh, excellent talk. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, on, a po on on this on this final kind of point that you made, actually, because it relates to um, something I've been thinking about for a while, and, and, and my research, which is based on on noise. And uh, so, so the distinction you made there, just 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 now between the pattern and process is, 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 uh, is something I've been thinking about. Because if we think about, uh, uh, well, a pattern um, can, be thought, can be understood as a regularity. Uh, and in the, uh, e even if it's a very complex one, like you're saying here in this kind of mosaic of, of, of matter of factual relations. Um, uh, whereas uh, we could think of... Uh, um, you know, non-periodicities non in in uh, in um, you know material relations between things, which would be kind of uh, uh, perhaps not so uh, not statable as facts in the same in the same way. Um, so uh, I you know I wonder whether kind of you know we could say at the at the limit you know uh, a of uh, of of the dis of calling something a pattern, there must be something which is not pattern, which would therefore just be process, uh, and, and uh, you know which, which couldn't be decomposed into a for into a set of regularities. So um, then I thought, uh, I mean, one of the things I I, I would like to f kind of just to to situate where our our speakers here today, in in, in some way, if I may, which is. <coughs> I think there's, I, th I think there's a kind of a, a broad agreement uh, amongst the speakers here with, with, that, that, for example, there's, uh, 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 they all re they all reject a kind of simple computationalist picture of the of cognition, uh, and uh, and you know, or uh, and move beyond it, uh, its description in terms of mechanistic causality. Um, so. But there's a there's a, I think a range of of of, of ways that, that that is taken by the different speakers here today, and I think so. Uh, uh, Giuseppe Longo is is uh, is uh, uh, has has written very strongly against the computationalist paradigm, uh, and uh, um, um, has used uh, the uh, has drawn on the the fact of uh, multi scale randomness at, ma at many layers in order to do so and so uh, he's arguing that uh, that there is for example in 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 processes like biological evolution or economic systems they are that the the processes are so complex that they cannot be given entailing laws Okay, so they can't they can't be uh, modelled as uh, as uh, an NK landscape with a, as an NK, an NP complete problem, for example. So they're not algorithmically searchable or, or definable. Now, on, on on the other side, I think uh, you know uh, Johanna Seipt uh, and, and and Ray to some degree are are arguing that there is a certain you know that that. that that there is not a necessary fundamental limits to the computational possibilities of decomposing those functions, so that there, so that it is possible to to uh, to to decompose those inferential strategies uh, and to to automate them in some senses. Uh, now, um, in in some way, this uh, this uh, you know well. Let's take a, let, let's take um, uh, a, a, an example of uh, you know of course uh, kind of biological biological um, systems such as a, a, a fish. Its movement is unpredictable, uh, but we we can we can still fish catch fish right because they they they've got a regularity to their movement right they've got pattern govern behavior which we can regularly rely on you know with nets and 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 and, and so on 
But, uh, but when it comes to uh, complex systems which involving higher, co- higher cognitive animals, then, then it's a much more diff- di- different problem uh, and involves, um, you know, uh, for example, um, uh, p- the p- performativity of the model, c- uh, counter-performativities, and a complex kind of uh, array of these effects of, of the of the inferential practices involved in 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 that in that process. So then, uh, I think you know when it when it comes to uh, to kind of the the uh, the problems of prediction today and the way that they are they're being unfolded in in say. Uh, uh, AIs on on the on, in, in, on the internet. Um, it, there's uh, there's a um, there, there's a real uh, it, it, it's really well as as Giuseppe Longo argues this is a, a frame problem rather than an MP complete problem. So the the, the it's, it, it is a matter of defining the context within which a probability probability distribution unfolds. Rather than uh, rather than searching a, a, an already configured space, okay. So the space, because the because the space of possibilities are constantly changing and constantly in flux, the parameters are constantly changing. Then we can't say we can't give uh, a, a, a full list of all the possibilities of the states. So what we need is to uh, to to define the context for the operation of that. And I think that's what, exactly what's happening in rule governs behavior rather than, uh, r- rather than pattern, uh, sorry, rule obeying behavior rather than pattern, beha- pattern govern behavior. So it's the definition of a context for action, which would be uh, eff- effectively a solution to the frame problem. So, uh, so yeah, in, in, in in uh, in conclusion, I'd, I'd I'd just like to kind of bring up the questions of randomness, contingency, and noise with regard to the main uh, items of debate today, which are prediction, process, and reason, and uh, hope that we can articulate some kind of relations between them as we go throughout the day. Respond, or we have some. Uh, do we have maybe 10 minutes for a question? You would like to go for a question straight away? Okay, do you mind? Okay, uh, one there. So, uh, what's your name? Uh, David, and then Giuseppe. Hi, Ray. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry for recording. Thank Thanks. I, I, I was interested in Nico's point about computational tractability, and you mentioned it as well. Um, via a kind of rewiring sellers by Brandon. And I think one of the things that Brandon takes from Davidson is, is the point that no state is simply just going to have an inferential role. It's, going to, it's inferential role is going to depend on all sorts of auxiliary commitments. You know, what you believe about the world will determine what, what can be inferred from the other commitments uh, from your point of view. So you need some kind of update algorithm, if you like, whenever you're dealing with other speakers. And of course, that, that could be really complicated, because how do you figure out what kind of things you ought to attribute to other people, given what you've already attributed to them? That could actually be a really complex process. And it, it, it's not clear that that's a tractable one, because obviously an algorithm can be computation, computable, but not tractable. You know, arranging all the permutations of 30 things is that if you state the algorithm for doing it, you know, there are just too many possibilities to actually complete it. So there are, I guess there is a limit to the computational tractability given a plausible reading of a kind of function of semantics or talking about. Okay, so, so I mean, um, now, when you say it's not algorithmically tractable, so it wouldn't be possible then to articulate the inference and something like a, 
kind of yes, a kind of uh, a reinforce something that is kind of simply I algorithmically know, yes. But, okay. uh, I mean, I, I think there's an issue there simply because of the the, the complexity of interpreting. Obviously. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, that's all. I'm not. I don't know the groups. I I, um, I know in in, in uh, Brand in some way it goes through a sort of describes a procedure that a speaker has to adopt in imputing commitments to other speakers, you know, so eliminating certain inferences on the basis of other beliefs they have. You know, it's pretty complicated yes. and it's not, you know, it's not clear whether we could write a program to do that. You know, that's all. I, I guess that, that's a, something to think mm. about. Um, yes, I mean, I think... Look, I mean, I think uh, what is powerful, I think, or still kind of powerful about this account is that, um, or at least, you know, the Salarian version that I find quite compelling is that um, the, you know, uh, the pattern governed dispositions <coughs> that, you know, Speakers need to acquire in order to be able to think, you know, to speak and think, um, are not, um, you know, they are just kind of, they are a set of cultural contingencies. Okay, they're, they're going to be contingent uh, because of, you know, biological, historical, and cultural um, circumstances. Um, so there's no now whether, I mean. So there's no claim that these... So in other words, these are only kind of, you know, I guess, and you can correct me about this if I'm wrong, but I guess th these would only be algorithmically decomposable in some kind of trivial sense in which anything is. So it's not... They're, they're not kind of... Um, um, because of the primacy of material inference in this account, um, a mater you know, what generates... Um, a material inference is simply a habit, okay? A kind of the acquiring a habit. Yeah, but I guess yeah. that if, if we're going to make sense of how speakers stand actually works, that's going to have to be a key context. You know, so yes. For example, yes. To take Davis, it's if Mrs. Malacroft says this yeah. is a nice arrangement of epi okay. epitaphs, <laughs> you've got to kind of interpret her meaning in the, in the light of the situation you're in rather in terms of some standard kind governing a whole language. Ah, ah, but I think, okay, this is an important... I think once you understand rules, I mean, rules are context. This is why, in a way, the ability to understand a rule is not necessarily itself conceptually tractable. You can't break it down into a series of instructions. Mm. The whole point about normative functionalism is that rules can't be decomposed into a set of propositional statements because it's know-how. This is a kind of know-how, so it's always, you know, it's, it's highly context-sensitive and context-dependent. This is why, so it's the kind of the old riding a bike example, you know. So in a way, knowing how to reason, knowing what to say, is like riding a bike in that it's an incredibly, it's, it's a kind of, uh, you know, the accumulation of an incredibly complicated, you know, set of kind of, um, if, you know, um, circumstances, um, but although when you know these philosophers give example, they always say as if you know you, you kind of exemplify a rule propositionally by saying in circumstance when in circumstance C do A. Mm. Um, but it's not clear, in fact, whether you know rules are um, can be propositionally encapsulated. And the whole point is that you don't need to rehearse a series of propositions to follow a rule. That's the basic. Claim. And so in that sense, I think it's, it's not so kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of, a, it recognises the same difficulty with classic kind of, you know, rule-based accounts. Um. Giuseppe. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, I think you, you've been uh, presenting distinction uh, theory and meta theory, language and meta language in a very effective way. And this is a very fruitful distinction. In mathematics and mathematical logic, it clearly helps in work. But in no way this intrinsic, this objective, 
is strongly contextual and it very often in the crucial cases totally disappears. I mean, Hilbert first in 904 thought he had proved the consistency of arithmetic, his main conjecture in 1900, by a proof by induction. Then Poincare told him, well, you know, you are proving the consistency of arithmetic by induction, which is the fundamental axiom of arithmetic. So it's circularity. Then Hilbert thought, I do that in the meta theory. And that's when the notion was invented. He said, I'm going to prove by a meta induction the consistency of arithmetic which contains induction. Then Hermann Weyl told him, well, you know, Professor, Professor Hilbert, he was a student at the time, he was very skeptical. Meta theoretic induction is actually theoretic induction because it's the same mathematical stuff. And indeed, this is what Gödel did. What he did is that he showed that the meta theory of arithmetic, which contains the notion of probability, which is a meta theoretical notion, can be fully encoded in the theory. So the meta theory, by Gödel's proof, is a subset of the theory. Anytime you have a, 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 a formulation, anytime you have a formal theory in mathematics that includes arithmetic, this theory can encode and as contained as a subset its finitistic meta theory. That's the core of Gödel's proof. So as soon as you have finite descriptions and your theory meta theoretic finite description and your theory is powerful enough to contain arithmetic, the distinction totally disappears. As soon as your rules are written in a positional finitistic fashion, they belong to the theory by encoding. So it's very effective to make difference to say, for example, I write my notes in Italian as meta theoretic remarks on my English writing. That's very convenient to make the distinction. But you must be aware that it totally disappears when you work at the formal level. And in other contexts, they may have different meanings. Okay. okay. Oh, um, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask a question. No, okay. no that um, was the question. Okay, um, well, okay, one thing I'll say... Um, um, two things. One is that this, you know, as I, as I understand them, Sellers is not... I mean, the whole point is that this, um, in a way, the kind of the boundary between levels is... Uh, seems to be porous in some way. Uh, it's not clear... In so far as, in a way, he's saying that the ability, I mean, whether you want to call it, you know, m maybe it's misleading to characterize it in terms of, like, object and, you know, object meta, you know, first order, second order. Um, because, in fact, I think what he's interested in is a kind of reflexivity um, or a kind of involution where um, patterns, I guess, um, certain patterns become, um, I guess, you know, kind of embedded and nested within one another. Now, I don't know if that's, um, I mean, in, in his account, the only, you know, the work that's done by the distinction is explaining how you can um, treat, um, you know, treat something on one stratum of language as um, as a mere you know as if it was a, a perceptual object as a, as a mere kind of inscription in terms of its kind of perceptible properties, um, and then there's a kind of a, a you know the use mentioned distinction also does some work in this argument. Um, now, okay, so I mean, do you think therefore that do you think that every distinction? So, well, Simply, do you think that reflexivity as such um, is beholden to this, you know, to this kind of bad kind of stratification that you think is redundant? No. Uh, on one side, I think it's been technically very useful and keeps being useful all the time. But we must be aware that according to the context, there is no section external role of the meta theory with respect to the theory. Okay. As soon as you are in finitistic linguistic uh, frames, and as soon as your theory is, pa is powerful enough, the meta theory may be included in it, may be encoded in it. 
That's what I'm saying. Which brings reflexivity within the theory. Mm -hmm. That's the trick of Gödel. Exactly by that, he writes a, a formula saying, I am not provable. This is a code that in arithmetic, and then it is not provable. But the notion of probability is meta theoretic. So indeed, this enforces reflexivity. It brings at one level the apparent reflexivity due to the existence of pretending existence of two levels. It's even stronger, what I'm saying. But we handle this, we live with that. It's quite normal to, to reflect to ourselves, to access sort of singularity. Life is all of that. In enormous, almost everything is correlated to almost everything. There is no global level which is distinct from the local level. The local level is causally related, intricate to the global level. These sort of reflexivities are everywhere. But we cannot detangle them mm -hmm. in an artificial led way by saying, for example, in, in biology, I totally distinguish the molecular level from the organismal level. No. Because there is no molecular cascade that is causally independent from the global level and vice versa. So we have to face these reflexivities all the time. Okay. okay thanks. Uh, a question from John. <coughs> Yes, I, it took me, I mean, I spent years trying to understand this distinction. <laughs> and uh, I'm still, you know, I'm far from confident I understand it. Um, precise, I mean, he introduces the kind of, uh, I mean, he begins by saying that what seems to motivate the distinction initially is to say that there's a difference between that the... Um, a on the one hand, a game is defined by its rules. Okay, that's the minimal kind of that's the you know the, what individuates a, a game is the rules. Um, but when and although every move playing the game is obviously kind of um, 
determined uh, by those rules. The rules themselves are not part of the game. The rules themselves are not part of the game in the sense in which the objects with which you play the game are. So, for instance, when you play football, you know, you play with, like, you know, there's grass there, there's men in shorts running around, a white ball, goalposts, but those are all the objects. There's nothing, you know, they're playing football, but the rules of football are not kind of, you know, part of the apparatus that is being manipulated or that is in the game. Um, I, t I mean, so I think that that, I mean, as I understand it, that's what Seller seems to, wants to be getting at. Um, though maybe, I mean, I think maybe the, the, the distinction is unhelpful because I think he ends up saying it's almost as if, you know, the, the distinction is, it's not really, maybe it's unhelpful, maybe it's actually a kind of an unhelpful distinction because it encourages you to think that, it encourages one to think that there is this, you know, this hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear that it is. It's not clear and because... Well, as you say, that there is a difference between the functional role of expressions in, you know, at one level and its functional role at another. Mm -hmm. um, but then maybe talking about it in terms of, you know, the kind of levels, is, is maybe, that's, maybe it's context more than levels. But I don't know. I don't have... I, you know, I struggle to understand that distinction. And um, I, can, I, can, I can get a sense of the, what Sellers is trying to get from it, but I think... Well, obviously, it leads to if you if you took it, if you reify it and kind of turn it into some kind of you know fundamental distinction, then you know it seems to me all sorts of difficulties would ensue. Okay. But um, yeah. okay, thank you very much. I think we have a break of fifteen minutes to have a coffee, and then we come back for this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you.